Good uh, morning, everybody. Uh, so I'm uh, Bartubin, and I will be running a couple of sessions on uh, SDLC, Secure Development Life Cycles. So you might have been familiar, you might have heard the term SDLC before. Sometimes it's confused by Software Development Life Cycle. They tend to give it different names. Sometimes we hear SDL, uh, sometimes we hear SSDL. It's all related to the same software. We hear, we hear uh, the term, sometimes we hear the term software assurance. It's all linked to the same topic, uh, building secure software. We're giving, we're uh, running three sessions on the topic. Uh, so uh, this first session is an introductory session on the topic, what is it? Why do we need to think about it? And we will be running this afternoon two other sessions on it. One on uh, maturity models, which is a very specific uh, type of model that we're using to build, to build more secure software. And we're all doing, also doing an experience session this afternoon to really try it out in practice, to reason about it, discuss it a lot. Uh, very interesting session, in my opinion, to, to attend to as well. Um, so what's actually, why are we running these sessions? What's, what's the point of this? Um, one of the things is that application security is kind of a strange, strange thing. We're doing an entire week on all application security topics. Um, we're seeing a lot of problems that we have. We're also seeing a lot of solutions that we have. And if we look, if we look today at software that's out there in the market, uh, software, uh, companies are running software, we still <coughs> don't succeed in building secure software. We still get a lot, of, a lot of software out there on the market in production that has, that has a lot of vulnerabilities in there. Why is that the case? Very strange. We've been talking, Jim has been talking about injection problems, SQL injection problems. We know very well how to deal with them. It's out there. The, the practices are there. Why are we not using that? Um, that's kind of the reasons. It's, it's, it's application security, it's not only a technical problem. It's also a matter of getting yourself organized within an organization putting the, the necessary priority on, on security while building software. And that's kind of the idea behind these SDLC models. Getting your, organized, getting your organization organized such that you can spend sufficient time and you can do necessary activities to make sure that the end result, the software get, that gets out of the life cycle, has sufficient security properties built in. Does that mean that we are trying to build all applications to a, to a very high standard in terms of security? No, not, not at all. That's not the point. We want to invest the money. We want to invest the money in your organization, the budget, where it matters. And so we want to invest security activities where it really matters. That's all part of this SDLC kind of, kind of topic. Okay, so quick words. If, wait, wait. Quick words about myself. Um, so my name is Bart Wien. I've been... Um, working in the domain of information security for the past 20 years. Um, I did a PhD at the University of, of Leuven, so I know quite some, some people here as well. Um, currently, for the past six years, I'm working as, an, uh, as a uh, yeah, senior manager uh, at, uh, at PwC Belgium. Actually, I, 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 uh, currently a director, so the slide is a bit old there. Uh, but, where, but where I'm responsible for all the services related to application security or application quality in general. So what we do, we do a lot of testing of software, uh, architecture reviews, code reviews, penetration testing, but we also qu work quite a lot with, uh, with organization on the topic of, of software development life cycles. And there you really see that the companies are really struggling with what, are, what should we be doing? Uh, what are peers doing? What are the best things that we should be doing in the current, in the current circumstances? And so we're doing quite a lot of uh, projects on, on, uh, with organizations on that as well. Um, I'm also the co-leader of the SAM project. I don't know if you're familiar with SAM. It's one of the software assurance models. And actually, it's a model that we'll be discussing this afternoon. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you want to know more, uh, please join the session then. Uh, but it's one of the, the more important, I would say, maturity models out there for building secure software. And actually, um, we're going to release new versions on, of SAM in the very near future. I was kind of hoping it, that it would be released for today. So over the past weekend, but we didn't succeed. But it will be for the coming week or, or two weeks or so. So it will be very, very, very nearby. Um, you have also my contact uh, information there below. If you want to contact me with some discussions, questions, don't hesitate. Yeah? Okay. <clears throat> uh, 
maybe I would like to first quickly ask your um, like role in the organization, just to get an, an idea. Uh, what, what is your role in the organizations that you that you're working? Who in the in the in the room is uh, is developing <coughs> software? Actually, coding software. It's kind of five five six people. Okay. Are there any architects in the room? Okay. Some of them some of the same people. Um, testers. Any software testers? No testers in the room. Uh, people in working operations, maybe. Operations. Okay. 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 Perfect. Any people working for secu the security department itself in the organization? Okay. Okay. Kind of four. Okay. And who did I miss? Any any other roles? What what roles? Analysts maybe or other roles? Uh, I'm kind of team leader. Team leader. Okay. Yeah. For for development teams, that is. Development or or configuration of packages. So yeah. Configuration is uh, custom development. Yeah. 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 Okay. And others? Did I miss other roles? Uh, yeah, I'm governance. Governance. Okay. Okay. Not specifically security related. Okay. Perfect. So we have a very mixed audience. That's that's great. Then we can have a lot of uh, interesting discussions uh, as well. Uh, that's uh, also one of the things I want to mention. This point, this, these sessions can be are the most interesting for you if they're interactive. I think I will. I have a lot of material that I will teach you. That I will try to teach you. But whatever problems that you're facing in the organization, whatever questions that pop your mind, don't hesitate. It's uh, it's interesting discussions. So and you will learn the most when we when we can discuss about these things. Otherwise, it's just uh, a lot of theory that that might be uh, a bit more a bit less interesting. Uh, so for the session, for this session, I will be discussing uh, mostly about uh, why are we, why do we need these mature, these uh, software development life cycles, and also about process models. Process models that are, that are being used today to build software within organizations, and I want to talk about uh, more like traditional process models, like typically waterfall development. What can you do during, uh, in terms of waterfall development? How can you augment the waterfall life cycles? But also in terms of agile development, more and more companies are doing agile. Uh, so how can we deal with security for agile, agile uh, development uh, structures? And that's that will be kind of the the the, the main part of the of the presentation. I will be ending with uh, like a set of good practices that you might take into account within your organization, within your daily practices that might be interesting to also discuss or debate a bit about. Okay, that's kind of the outline of this uh, of, of this session. So let's uh, think about why do we need these uh, secure development life cycles. <coughs> First thing I want to mention or I want to discuss is the we're, we're kind of basically uh, in, a, in a quite difficult situation. In, in the sense that uh, the software that we're building is always getting more and more complex and business is always getting more and more demanding in terms of software that we're building. Eh? We have to build software. If you would compare the software complexity now with 20 or 30 years ago, you would see that it's an order of two more complex or two magnitude more complex than the software that we used to build like 30 years ago. So the complexity has risen dramatically, which also means that it's much more difficult to understand what software is doing and to secure it. That's one of the, one of the first points. Secondly, we are building, we're using a lot of technology stacks out there. If you're uh, doing software development nowadays, if you do it in uh, .NET or Java, it's not a single technology stack anymore. There's a lot of libraries, there's a lot of things going on, which make it a lot, which make it really complex to build this software in a secure way. Um, Ruby, Ruby on Rails, which I heard was some, uh, quite some uh, discussion as well in the first session. Uh, but the point is, for, ja uh, for jQuery, I Ajax Lite applications, we don't really understand anymore what's going on as a developer. The so software libraries are so complex, the software frameworks are so complex that we don't really know very well what's going on anymore. Which also means that as a developer to get something secure, it's very, very difficult. As an attacker, to attack an application, that's way more, that's way more easier. Because what they will do is they will try to find one hole in the application, whether it be in the functionality or in the underlying frameworks. They will try to find one hole. So in that sense, also building secure software, it's much more complex than attacking software. That's one of the core problems that, we, that we're having today. Uh, software are also is getting more and more connected. We, we are not building systems again uh, anymore in isolation. It's connected to all sorts of places, different organizations, different systems. 
we have to open up all our software, which also makes it more difficult to kind of close it down, of course. Um, um, and we always have to build uh, software uh, better, faster, and more adaptable. So the, the business will always demand us to build better software, better quality. We'll have to make sure that it's more adaptable, because if they think about a new requirement tomorrow, we'll have to be able to change our software. Changing software in terms of security is not so easy because you have to redo some analysis there to make sure that it's, it's, it's kind of controlled. Um, and we have to build it faster, you get less and less money and the time to market is always, is always decreasing. So you have to build software uh, more rapidly. Which brings us to an, um, oh, oh. Ah, there is some, some text missing there, <coughs> sorry about that. Hmm, okay. Uh, but it's kind of the, the fact that um, building up applications which um, are more adaptable, uh, you have to build better applications faster with, with less and less money, it's kind of an equation that does not hold anymore. Development teams are more and more under pressure to build their software and there's less and less room to think about what the software does. Is it really under control? What can we do with it? And it's, it's kind of a difficult situation. Um, we, uh, there are a lot of studies and statistics out there. Um, um, the majority of vulnerabilities today is at the application level. Is it 75%? Is it 70%? I, I don't know. There's a lot of statistics out there. This, is, uh, this, this comes from a Gartner report um, that, that we're measuring also the number of vulnerabilities out there. If you look at different statistics, they will differ a bit, but the endpoint will always be the same. The core situation or the core problem today in terms of security is at the application level, not at the network or the other levels, at the application level. So we have to, think, we have to, we have to, yeah. we have to do something about it. Personally, I think, and you might, you might disagree, but personally, I think that we're losing kind of the, the, the security battle. If we're building software, it's getting more and more difficult to, to the, the, the situation is deteriorating rather than the improving. In my opinion, we're building more and more software that, that's more and more vulnerable rather than the opposite. So we have to kind of find, find a way to, to, to shift that balance, to, to, reverse the, to reverse that balance. SDLC might be a way to do that, but I want to warn you beforehand, it's not an easy thing either. It's a, it's a, it's a complex, challenging endeavor uh, that, you, that you're going through. <coughs> okay, um, you're probably familiar with this symbol. Um, the, the reason why I kind of like it, it was actually used by uh, Gary McGraw in one of his books, uh, Building Security. I don't know if you're familiar with the books. It's, it's one of the, an interesting book on, on, on software development in general. But the, the, the reason why I like this symbol is it because it, it symbolizes very much the, 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 the white hat and the black hat side of, of security. Uh, and it's very important, in my opinion, for building software as well. While building software, you always have to think about, okay, how do you build software? But at the same time, how do you attack software? How do you, what are the, what are the, the security requirements, but what, else, what are also the threat requirements? What are uh, requirements related to attacking, attacking the system? How can you test it for functionality? How can you test it against security problems? So it's always a constant uh, switching between the, 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 the positive side and the negative side. While you're doing SDLC, this is very, very important. If you're only thinking about the black part, so like the negative part of security, you will be missing out on a lot of security functionality in your software. If you're only thinking about the white, the white side, and if you're only testing about security functionality, you will be missing a lot of security vulnerabilities that are linked to, to problems in your software. So whatever you do during software development, you will always have to think about like the positive side of security and like the negative side of, of, of security. Yeah? Security has two, si two sorts of um, requirements, what I would call uh, functional security requirements, which are all requirements related to security functionality. Uh, to give an example, authentication for instance. Authentication is a typical requirement that will change the functionality of your application, right? If you have to authenticate, you will have to build screens, login screens, it changes the, the behavior of your application. Yeah? There's quite an important category of security requirements that are linked to functionality. A second important category of, of requirements is linked to security quality. Yeah? A lot of the OS top 10 vulnerabilities actually relate to quality of software. 
injection attacks, again, relate to quality of software. If you're not doing proper input validation, it will lead to injection attacks in your application and you will have vulnerabilities in there. But so, there are two important categories of, of requirements and again, it's the white and the black. You have to think about both, both sides of it. Okay? Okay, so what is, what is SDLC about and why, why are we doing this? Um, let's, let's, let's discuss this for a bit. So, if you would look at a regular development life cycle, a traditional waterfall mo uh, development model, um, you would have different phases in this model, uh, going from analysis over design, coding, implementation, testing, uh, uh, you, know, you, know, you know the drill. Uh, there are a number of interesting things to note about this. First of all, the type of, the type of security problems that are introduced in software. It turns out that there are, that are two uh, different types of security problems introduced in software, and they're called bugs and flaws. Okay? Flaws are like logical errors in your software. You forget to introduce an authorization model, for instance. You forget to make sure that functionality is properly authorized before actually being able to execute it. That's a flaw. It's, it's, a, it's a flaw in the analysis, it's a flaw in the design of the application. Bugs, on the other hand, are typical implementation glitches. Like you're coding and you've, you forget to do some input validation. Okay, you might have an, uh, an injection attack in your application. It's more related to the implementation or the deployment. You're deploying your software, but you forget to put a security switch on. Uh, you forget to enable TLS, for instance. That's, that's a glitch. It's not something that was, that was wrong in design, although for the TLS part it could be wrong in design, but it might also have to do with, with like glitches in operations, things that you're forgetting. Now, the interesting thing about this is that, first of all, the, the, the time when they are interest, introduced in the software during the life cycle is different. Huh? Flaws are typically introduced in the earlier phases during software development life cycle. During analysis, you're forgetting that there is that you have to enable authorization or you have to think about authorization requirements, right? During design, you're forgetting to implement or you're forgetting to annotate TLS to a connection, something like that. These are flaws that are uh, relevant for the software and introduced in the earlier cycles, in the earlier phases of the life cycle. While uh, bugs are typically introduced in the later cycles, during implementation, during deployment, during maintenance. So that means that during the entire phase, uh, during the different phases of the development life cycle, different types of vulnerabilities can be introduced in the software. Okay? Now, studies have shown that the, the ratio of bugs versus flaws in software is almost 50-50. So we have almost equally number of flaws than as bugs in software. And of course, it has not been very academic studies, but they have, they have been testing software. And that's kind of the, 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 the ratio that they see. Yeah? What is a, a bug? Uh, what is the number of a bug, I mean? What is a flaw? What is a, a bug? Yeah, so... If, uh, if you say number of flaws and number of bugs, do I see that in, like, which impact they have or how many there are? How many? How many? <laughs> yeah. So we're not talking about impact yet. It's more like if you would count the number of uh, flaws versus the number of bugs, that's, that's, that's what uh, the ratio is about. But so, if you uh, typically, um, um, if during analysis, uh, requirements, there's not a lot of security requirements in there, right? If, if, you would took a, if you would look at requirements documents for a piece of software, it's mostly about functional requirements, not very often about non-functional requirements. So there you already see a number of missing elements in there which would count as a flaw, okay? And if you would count all those together, then the ratio is almost 50-50. Yeah. yeah. So does that imply that like, the impact of both these things are equally the same? No, no, okay. that doesn't imply that. Okay. It might be the case that flaws uh, in some situations have much higher impact, uh, but it might also be the reverse. It can be the case that by forgetting uh, an, a particular requirement, it kind of gets solved later on because it's, it's for instance, hidden by the software, or there are, there are other mitigating measures in place that actually limit the impact of that, of that flaw. So it can be, it can be, it can go to uh, both ways. Okay? Okay. Uh, 
Now, so that's one first interesting thing to note. The ratio is almost 50-50, right? Second interesting thing is, if you look at the cost to fix a particular problem in software, and now I'm talking about problem, and it can be a security problem, it can be uh, another type of problem as well. The cost actually raises exponentially through the software development life cycle. Um, and it has to do with a number of things. It, it's not so, so very uh, un unnatural to think about that, because uh, suppose you have a security requirement that's missing in your requirements document, and you figure that out during the analysis phase, it will cost you two hours to fix it. You take the document, you, uh, you add the security requirement there, you save the document, you publish it again, and it's, 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 it's solved, right? Well, if you wait, if you would wait uh, for the system to be in production, and you have to fix the missing security requirement at that moment in time, you basically have to redo the entire effort. So you have to redo the entire analysis, design, implementation, test phase, all this, because you have forgotten one, one security requirement in an analysis document. So the cost, it raises quite high. I know I've run ahead a little, but uh, is that kind of better in the agile development model, where it's more natural to add requirements? Could you say that adding a security requirement or something like that <coughs> along the way is easier, maybe? Yeah, that's, that's actually a very interesting point. And I would indeed, I would suspect, I, I haven't seen statistics that have done uh, similar analysis for agile development. So I, I don't have like hard figures, but I would expect that the, the, the curve would be a bit flatter in agile development because the, the entire implementation effort that you're doing, you're basically splitting that in, in, in small pieces. And so indeed, I would expect the curve to be, uh, to, to be flatter. But again, it would, it would rise, eh? okay, yeah, yeah. But it probably would not be exponential anymore as it, as it is in, in traditional uh, software development. Yeah. Okay, um, so the longer you wait with fixing a problem, the more costly it becomes, basically. That's kind of, that's kind of the, the statement. Okay, now, if we look at companies in practice nowadays, what are they doing? If we look at customers that we serve, but in general, it it's probably applies to your organizations as well. If you look at the life cycle, typically when people think about security is in different, in different phases. From time to time, we see that companies are doing architecture reviews. Security teams uh, for every architecture, that for every project uh, that, 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 will be, that will be running, there is an, an entire review of the software, uh, for the architecture of the software, and also sometimes security comes into play there. So security team would look at the design, would, re would evaluate the design to see is it okay in terms of security or not. But that's definitely not common practice. Not every organization does that, far from it. But we see it, we see it happening in, in companies. Yeah? Yeah. State of practice, the state of the art, or? No, no, the, yeah. I, 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 these are all testing mechanisms. There's no, no building activities yeah. anymore. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I gotcha, I gotcha. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of a bit of the point. What is, what is going on uh, today is missing a lot of elements and it's causing a lot of problems. I'm coming to that. Uh, what we then see is some companies are organizing penetration tests. So there's an important piece of software. Typically, there's an internet-facing piece of software. Organiz organizations tend to, to organize penetration tests for that because they think, okay, it's important software. It's internet-facing. They will have a lot of risk. It, it will pose a lot of risk to the organization. Let's, let's organize something. Very often for internal, internal applications, they don't do that. Okay, you might discuss about different uh, security posture, but in, in, in fact, the risk might be very high to the organization as well. I don't see a lot of, I, there, are, there are quite some companies, but in general, a lot of companies are only doing penetration tests for the outside world, for the internet facing applications. You might, you might think about that, reason about that. And then there's definitely still companies out there that are just doing penetrate and patch. They put it in production and then just wait to see what's happening. And if they are, uh, if they are like uh, hacked, okay, they will, they, will, uh, they will have consequences if they know that they're hacked. Because in, in many cases, they even don't know that, that there's a problem with the software. Now, thinking about this approach and the previous discussion, um, it's, it's kind of a problematic approach on, on dealing with security for a number of reasons. First of all, if you're purely thinking about penetration testing, you're not really, you're really focusing more on the bugs than on the flaws. You're focusing on implementation glitches rather than on flaws in the software. Yeah? 
depends on the type of test that you're doing, but a penetration test typically focuses more on bugs than on flaws. It's totally not cost efficient because you're waiting very long if you find something, and typically companies that do it like that, they will have like a red report with a lot of red flags in it, and it's like, oh no, we, we, we have to go in production in a week, and we have a red report full of red flags, what do we do? We don't have the time, we don't have the budget to fix it anymore, and the, the, the cost is much higher than if we would approach it from the beginning. And in terms of security assurance, it's also not, not interesting, because suppose that a penetration test found a number of vulnerabilities out there, uh, and you're fixing them in your team. What is the chance that everything is solved? Um, did, they, did it identify all the vulnerabilities in there? Did you, by introducing the fixes, did you not introduce new security vulnerabilities in there? So in terms of the quality of the product, you're actually not sure that it's actually improved over the, over the previous version. So in that sense, that approach, from an organization perspective, to deal with security, it's, no, it's, it's not, not a really good approach. It's kind of a problematic approach, I would say. Okay, so what is SDLC then about? Very simple. Think about security throughout the entire life cycle. Don't wait before going live, before going to production. Think about security. Start with security from the beginning. And with a, for a number of reasons, to, to increase cost efficiency, to make it more secure, a lot, of, a lot of these reasons. But that's kind of the bottom line of SDLC models. And that's what we're trying to achieve. Um, which is kind of a challenge. I keep on repeating that. We do a lot of these SLC projects. It's not easy for companies to, to implement it, but at least we're getting more grip on the security state of, of, of these softwares. That's, that's kind of the idea. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> If I, if I were to characterize what is SDLC about with a number of um, like, like qualities, it would be these qualities in my opinion. First of all, you want to make sure that the security in your applications is consistent. If you're building a piece of software today and you would build it again tomorrow, you would hope to end up with the same security quality in that piece of software. If you build a piece of software today by team A, and you would build another piece of software uh, today by team B, you would again hope to end up with a, with a similar piece of security quality in that software. It's about consistency. That's one of the first things. If we don't have that, we, don't, we are not able to control our software in our, in our company. It's about making it more efficient. Making it more efficient typically in terms of cost effectiveness, also in terms of uh, the, time, the, the, uh, the time to market the time needed to build a piece of software. If for every security problem that you're, that, you're, that you're dealing with, have to always rethink about what are we going to do about this, it will take you a lot of time. And chances are quite likely that you're not going to have the ideal solutions. So if we're able to standardize somehow the solutions that we have to put in place in our software, it will cost you, it will cost you less and it will be more efficient in terms of development. Yeah. Um, it's about demonstrating security. Security is something that's very gray zone. People are always, you typically would get the question, is your software secure? And it would be very difficult to answer that. First of all, what does secure mean? Very difficult question. Second of all, how can you measure whether it's, whether it's secure? And SDLC should be able to give you some arguments to tell you, okay, this, this, security, this software, piece of software, is according the, to that standard rating, scoring that kind of security level, somehow. You should be able to measure it some, to some extent. Otherwise, it's very difficult to, uh, to, to discuss. Um, it should be uh, standards compliant. Whatever standards that there are, often in a company you have a lot of standards that you should be taking into account, but also out there there's a lot of regulations and standards that typically apply to your organizations. You should, be able, you should make sure that you at least know what these standards are and whether you should take them into account or not. Right? Okay? Uh, and then a final word, very important, it should be risk in line with risk, it should be risk-based. If you're developing 100 applications, don't try to make every application as secure as possible because it will, will cost you a lot, a lot of money. There will be no return on investment and after a couple of years, the, 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 the CEOs of the companies will tell you, are you uh, what are you doing? You're burning budget and we're, we're having over, over secured applications. So try to make this, the activities that you do in line with the risk that, is, that the software is facing. If there's no confidential data in your application, if it's only an intern application and it's, if it's fairly limited in scope, 
Why spend all the security budget on that, on that type of application? So think about where are we putting our money for these applications? These SDLC models do that, right? We'll come back to that. Okay. Um, having said that, um, there is an, uh, a mental model that I will always try to use when thinking about what is an organization doing in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, software security. And it consists of si six cornerstones. Um, first cornerstone is what people do you have in your organization and to what extent do they know what they have to do in terms of security? Who is doing the, software, the analysis of the software? And is that pers person responsible of also identifying security requirements? Or should it be a different person? Who is actually responsible of putting the secure uh, implementation? Is it the developers? Is it other people? Who is doing the testing? What are the responsibilities of those people? And are they sufficiently knowledgeable and trained to do that? Very important. It's not always clear in organizations. When you would ask in your organization who is doing the security testing, then the development team typically would say, well, we think it's the testing team that does that. And if you would ask to the testing team, they say, no, it should be a security team because we're not, we not doing uh, security testing. And if you would ask, yep, yeah, okay. Is that a little easy to outsource? Because companies tend to like to, uh, to outsource a lot of, a lot of these, especially uh, profiles or roles that are not needed on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, I think it's it, it can be outsourced uh, to some extent, uh, but outsourcing will only work if the, the the outsourcee, so the people coming to the company, will work on a on a daily basis with the organization. So only doing asking activities per activity uh, in an outsourced model that's very difficult to achieve. I think. So. If you don't have the competencies in-house, you might hire them, but then make sure that these people work inside the context, Be because it will only work if they understand how the organization is running, and that will require presence, it will require continued uh, working together on the, on, on, on the floor, basically. I think it, I, I think it can be, uh, but within, within certain uh, yeah, constrained conditions. Yeah. Okay, second thing is the process. The process, how are you going to build software? Are you using waterfall? Are you using agile? Are you using very, some very exotic process to build software? But how are you going to change that process to make sure that software assurance or the security is taken into account? How can you make sure that just before production go live, you're, you're sufficiently convinced that the security level is appropriate to that piece of software? How are you going to change that process? And it can be about what activities are you going to do for extra, uh, extra deliverables that you might, the, that you might produce, um, control gates that you put in place, so a piece of software does not pass the architecture control gate it hasn't, if it hasn't been uh, reviewed thoroughly for, for security, for instance, these kind of control gates that you might put in place. Um, it's also about knowledge, uh, making sure that people have this, the, this, the sufficient standardization guidelines in place that they know what to do. Yeah? Um, if every developer for himself has to figure out what to do uh, to avoid injection attacks, chances are very high that you will not eradicate, eradicate the, the injection attacks altogether in your, in, your, in your software. Make sure that you work on standardization, make sure that people know and that, that, they, that they know what to do. And finally, important tools and components. Make sure that you have sufficient tools in place to aid all the people in your organization to, to do analysis on software. Uh, who in the room has been doing code reviews for, for other people's code? A couple of people. How much time does it typically take, take to do a good code review? What would you, what would you, what would you say? How, many, how much hours a day do you take for, to do a code review? One hour a day. One hour a day, but that's like um, small pieces of, uh, of, of code then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you would look at an entire application, of like 100,000 lines of code. That's, that's a doable. Yeah. Two weeks. <laughs> Two weeks, three weeks, something like that. Eh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So start counting. If you have 100 applications in your organization being built every year, how are you going to do with that? How are you going to do that? So you need to be able to have some supporting tools out there that might assist you in doing that job. 
but there are tools out there that do code reviews to some extent you might be able to leverage them okay uh, then what I said before risk is a very important argument in SDLC uh, security does not come from free for free if you want to build secure applications tomorrow you will have to have some budget to improve the situation that you have today it will not come for free typical discussion that you will always have with business they will expect from you the highest possible security level for no budget ask them what they expect ask them are you expecting this are, are you sure okay sure we can do that no problem but this is what it will cost and ask them again is this what you expect probably they will lower the bar do the same calculation again this is what it will cost and they will do that debate only then they will realize how much it will cost to actually build secure applications it's a very common situation this kind of situation very common situation do that discussion okay uh, <clears throat> yeah how do you do that discussion with management if you said before that you can actually measure security so how do you what, what you deliver? Um, well, very typically for projects, you would typically have in the beginning of a project lifecycle, you would have an, a, a project uh, uh, project file where you discuss what what are the requirements, what will be the budget to do that for the for the whole project. Eh? It's a bit different for agile development, but even there for agile development, you can do these discussions. Um, and we'll, be come back, we'll come back to that for agile development as well um, if you have a number of functionality um, a, a number of tasks, user stories, epics, whatever that you want to achieve um, what kind of impact of security on that and shouldn't be there also the, be some, some user stories that you want to implement as well and what do these cost, how many days do you need to implement that user story and then again you end up in, in, in that discussion yeah. um, I think for agile development, I'm, I'm running ahead here, um, building secure applications is a bit more difficult than it is for, for waterfall development, but I'm happy to, be, to, to do discussion uh, later in the sessions if you don't agree, but yeah, I love, I, there's a lot of slides that, that, I can, uh, that, that we can discuss to, to, to see why it's, it's a bit more difficult, uh, but I tend, to, I tend to feel that it's more difficult to get it under control. Uh, and I've, I've, I've worked at both sides basically, for both, for both the waterfall and the agile development side. Okay, so is it, um, is it uh, important? What can we gain? Well, yes, we can, we can win. Um, we, have, we have seen that um, companies that are, that are doing a proper SDLC are actually uh, quite significantly decrease the number of vulnerabilities that they have in the software. Of course at the cost. It always comes at the cost. But they, they succeed in decreasing. That's already a good, a good statement. Uh, there are also statements that, that say that um, it's, uh, it's actually getting you a return on investment. So whatever penny you invest in security, in the long run, you will get it back. These discussions are a bit more difficult. We've seen papers about it, we've seen studies about it. I can show you papers that discuss about it. It's not always clear. It's not always like hard cut facts, but, but there, are, there are arguments out there. Okay, um, to kind of wrap up this part of the, of the session, uh, there are a lot of, a lot of uh, statistics out there. Microsoft has shown some statistics with their SDL. Uh, and actually, they kind, of, uh, they kind of see quite well in reducing the number of vulnerabilities or high vulnerabilities out there. So for instance, this was the browser. It's already old statistics, eh? 2007. Uh, these are the browser, Internet uh, 6 and 7, for instance. They have been doing their Microsoft SDL, and you see like drop -in, the drop-in uh, vulnerabilities out there. Same for SQL Server. Uh, they had a very significant decrease of number of vulnerabilities in the SQL Server. Uh, the same for um, the Windows operating system, same, same <coughs> arguments there. But Microsoft has been investing quite a lot in this SDL, but also succeed in reducing the number of vulnerabilities. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay? I think they had to. That's yeah, they had to, indeed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, they would have gone uh, bankrupt, I think. But. <coughs> okay. To give you an overview, uh, last, last slide for this, uh, for this introduction, to give you an overview, um, these are a number of in initiatives that, you, that, that are there in the domain, that are out there that you might uh, look at if, you, if you're interested in this. You can basically categorize them in, in three different parts. Uh, first of all, you have a part that's, that's really linked to uh, standard, um, wait, eh? let's see if there's, 
Okay. There's a part that you can link to standard development models. And these are more like waterfall type of development models. And so there's Microsoft SDL, NIST has a model, OWASP has a model, SAFE, Go, there's a number of these small and Gartner, they have, they, there's a number of models out there. They're kind of heavily oriented towards waterfall development, right? For agile development, at this point in time today, we don't have a lot of good standard models that tell us what to do. We have a lot of talks, discussions, presentations. We don't have a lot of standard models yet. There are some things, I will be discussing some things, but it's not that we, as a community, know what to do yet. Um, second thing is we have a number of maturity models out there. I will be discussing one, uh, these maturity models in a second session, right? Uh, they, they take a different stance. The, the starting point for these maturity models is totally different than the process models. But uh, we'll be discussing that in the afternoon. And then there is a number of models that are more like general principles, practices, best practices, these kind of things. Also there exists a number of these uh, on these models. Uh, generally accepted security software, software security principles, for instance, is one of them. There's a number of them. Yeah? They can give you inspiration on how to deal with security in software. And quite recently, actually, ISO has also an, uh, a new standard, or it's building on standard 2734, which, which, which is actually an, a management system, management system on top of building secure software. So it's not very similar to these other models, but it's, it's, it's managing how we should be building this software. It's, it's management system on top of that. Okay, let's look into the process models, unless there's any other, any other questions or remarks at this point in time. No? Okay. So process models, I will be looking at traditional models, right? Traditional waterfall development, what can we do about that? There's a number of things. Uh, typically what happens is you take a standard traditional waterfall model and you enhance it with new security related activities to try to get a grip on security properties of the outcome of the, soft, of the development lifecycle. That's what happens, right? The best way to discuss it, in my opinion, is to take one particular model. And the example that I would like to take is the Microsoft SDL model. In my opinion, a quite um, um, elegant model to see what's, what's out there, what are the extra activities that you should be doing to get, just to get you an idea. Now, before I start by discussing that, I want to make a point is that Whatever company that you're in, it will never make sense to just take a standard model out there and apply it to your company. It will not work. What you will have to do is take, take, model, take one model, take two models, take three models, get inspiration from those models and start combining different elements into a model that fits your organization. Unless you're a, 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 a company that does a, uh, software development exactly like Microsoft, it doesn't make sense to apply this model uh, like it is described exactly. You will always have to tweak it, adapt it to, to fit it to your organization, okay? So this is the Microsoft SDL model. What does it consist of? It consists of the traditional waterfall type of model and then a lot of extra activities that they introduce for security. Of course, they're also doing a lot of activities here and here and here. Uh, we've hidden them here. So it's, it's not like, it might seem that there's much more security activities than the other traditional development activities, that's not the case. But still, you see it's quite a lot, actually. It's not one or two activities that you have to do extra, no, it's quite a lot of things that you have to do. Okay, so let's, let's run through them. I'll go by them one by one per, per, uh, per phase to see what Microsoft is, has been doing or is doing. First of all, in terms of training, they spend quite a significant amount of time on training their people. Making sure that people know what to do, what are the things that they have to take into account to build more secure software. This might be general awareness trainings, but also all specific trainings. So once you know generally what is risk, what is security, you can start training analysts, developers for specific, for specific tasks to their day-to-day -to -day job. What are they training about? Yeah. Design, threat modeling, secure coding, testing, privacy, a lot of topics. And of course, they're constantly updating their curriculum. That's, that's what is going on. Why do you train people? Quite, 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 quite easy. You first want to make sure that people understand the problems out there, understand what you can do about these problems, but also understand the trends. What is going on? What might happen in the future? And what should I, as, a, as an employee, detect in terms of to be able to react to security challenges, problems that you have in the, while, while building software. Okay. 
about requirements, they are, number, they are doing a number of things. First of all, uh, they make sure that there are some persons involved in the requirements of in your project. Security people involved in your project. So for instance, um, every project has a trusted advisor. A security advisor coming from a security team or a governance team or whatever. It might come from a team that's like dedicated to so so secure software. Um, and so every team also has a security responsible person that with whatever question that you might have, whatever problem that you might face in building this software, you might go to. And it's his responsibility to figure out a solution, however he does that. Okay? And then they have an interesting thing which they call the bug bar. And it's an interesting concept in my opinion. So what they do is, what, every time in an organization when you go live, just before that you have to go, you have to make the decision, will I go live with this piece of software, yes or no? Right? All, always the case. What happens very often is that all the functionality works well, but there's quite a bit of red in security be, because of pen tests, because of other ways that you, that you see that. What happens then quite often is the decision, we will go live and we'll fix it afterwards. Depending on the type of company that you are, in banks might do that a bit less than, than uh, retail companies, for instance, depending on the type of company, but it happens quite often. Okay. To avoid that situation, they've installed a bug bar. And they say, for this type of project, in the beginning, we want to fix what are the acceptance criteria just before go live. So if you hear, say, for instance, we don't go live without any high vulnerabilities in there, they will not go live with any high vulnerabilities in there. So they fix it up front. And I think it's a very clever way of dealing with that decision that always goes in the wrong direction for, for security, right? Uh, <clears throat> second thing that they do is a cost analysis. Security has a cost. Remember this, right? What they do up front is do the cost analysis for security. So suppose you know all the functional requirements. They do an analysis. What will it cost in terms of security and privacy? And is it still valuable? Does it still make sense for that project to spend that, that amount of security money in there? They do that cost analysis and they take that into account for the project, uh, the project file, the project uh, initiation document, whatever you want to put in there. If it turns out that the security will be too high, the security cost will be too high, that's like, uh, where are we there? Somewhere here or so. They will discuss about lowering the security requirements and then also lowering the cost. Or, it's kill, or kill the project. Or kill the project, exactly, yeah. If it turns out that it's impossible to, de to implement the project uh, without, uh, for that budget, then you will just kill the project. Yeah, yeah. But you avoid this situation, basically. You avoid that they, they expect this and you only have this. Okay? Okay, during design, what they do, two things. They make sure that they have best practices in, line for in, in place for design. Uh, uh, typical design patterns, uh, reusable components, whatever these kind of things that they have them in place. So designers or architects know what they should be doing in terms of in terms of design. This is not about coding. This is about design. So you have in place a number of standard elements, components, whatever. First thing. Second thing, uh, they they will do a risk analysis of the system, right? Once the architecture has been put in place, once it's defined, they will do a risk analysis to discover what are any uh, remaining risk in the design, can I do something about it? They have a technique for that called Stride. You might have heard about it. It's, it's a bit like a systematic approach to do threat modeling for applications. Quite, quite nice technique to do, uh, to do threat modeling. They do that for applications. Okay, implementation. Um, you would expect that they will, they will be doing secure coding, which they do, and they have uh, best practices for development, where, where they will have coding standards. What can you do? What shouldn't you be doing? What should you avoid? Uh, but they're also thinking about how our users are going to use this piece of software. And they will start writing user documentation. They will start writing guidelines, all these kinds of things, to make sure that once a user is using a piece of software, that he doesn't like uh, switch off security. I, uh, it's not. Uh, Literally like that, of course, but they will do something stupid that the kind of breaks the security model of that, of that, of that piece of software. Okay. Um, <clears throat> during testing or verification, they will do two things. 
Uh, first of all, the standard security and privacy testing. They had a lot of techniques and testing methodologies in place to do security testing, both for security and privacy. Uh, you might be thinking about uni te unit testing, uh, user testing. One of the things that they do, for instance, quite frequently is fuzzing. Fuzzing, they throw a lot of garbage at the application and, and, to see, and they just see where it, does it break, where does it crash. Because if it crashes, then you know that you have to do something about it. You have, you have uncovered the vulnerability out there. Um, a lot of the, 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 the jailbreaks and other uh, problems in, in Microsoft are det or in, in Windows, for instance, operating systems are detected through fuzzing. Also, the hackers use the fuzzing techniques quite often to try to discover uh, vulnerabilities out there. Microsoft itself does it as well, to just try to find as many as possible the vulnerabilities or the problems in the software. And then a second interesting thing, in my opinion, is the security push. What they do is, um, again, typically the problem of time. You don't have enough time to spend on, on, software, on security during the software development lifecycle. They reserve an amount of time to spend on security. So what they do, they will stop regular development. They will reserve like two or three weeks to work on nothing else than security to increase the security posture or properties of, of your piece of software. That's what they call the security push, just to make sure that every project has enough time to work on security problems. Interesting concept. You don't see that very often in organizations. Quite interesting, in my opinion. Okay. Then, um, the, the, in the release phase, um, and this, for instance, might not, might not at all be relevant for you, but they typically do a public pre-release, like a beta review, these kind of things. So they kind of release the software in beta mode and ask people to test it. And whatever problems come in, come in again, they will revisit, see if it's really a problem, can we fix it somehow. It, this, for instance, might not be relevant at all to you as an organization. That's how they organize it. At the same time, they start preparing for incident response. So once the software does go live, and once it's out there, whatever problem that comes in, they should be able to quickly react on every, on every problem that comes in. So they prepare that during the pre-release phase to make sure that they have a team, that they have the procedures in place, responsibilities in place, and that, uh, that they have people to make sure that they can react on, on everything that comes in. Okay? And then finally, before release, they will do a final privacy and security review just to make sure, okay, we're going live, let's say tomorrow or next week, what are the remaining issues out there and can we go live with that? Is it in line with the bug bar that we have set? Can we take the risk to go live with these kind of vulnerabilities in the system? And once they decide to do, then they start manufacturing, pressing CDs, they still do that to some extent, uh, release to the web, uh, these kind of things um, to, go, to actually go live. And once you are live, then it's, it's a matter of maintaining and uh, making sure that whatever comes in as an incident, you can, you can react on that. Okay? So that's kind of the activities that they do. Now you see that it's quite uh, a significant yeah, extra amount of time that you will need to invest in doing, in doing this for building secure software. Um, I don't think they released um, statistics on how much it costs for them. To actually implement it. I haven't seen those statistics at least. Might be the case, but I haven't seen them. But in general, um, the, <coughs> the, the word is, or, or people tend to agree that the uh, amount of investment that you need to do is somewhere between 5 to 50 percent, 5 to 15, sorry, 5 to 15 percent of your project budget. So implementing secure applications will cost you 5 to 50 percent, 15, sorry, percent more than the regular application development. Depending on how risky the application, what, are the, what is the impact, what are the activities that we want to do, just to give you an idea. Yeah? Is that an easy sell to organizations? Because they hear 10, 15 percent. Yeah. Suddenly... yeah. It's, it's not an easy sell, um, but there are a number of, um, the, the, the situation is changing, and I think actually um, in Europe we're, uh, if you would compare it to the States, we're running a bit behind because here we still have to convince quite a lot the, the higher management that it's, it's, or the business that it's important to do. I think in the United States, it's the, the arguments are a bit easier because everybody tends to agree that we have to do it. 
easy sell, um, there's a number of arguments to be made. Uh, first of all, um, more and more companies start to see that as a competitive advantage. So they think they can make the arguments um, to their customers. We're doing it securely, so we, have, we are better than the competition, so people will buy our products. That's starting to get into the minds of people in the organization. Not everywhere, but it's one of the arguments that plays. So far, in my experience, compliance has been a much stronger figure. Yeah, compliance that. is the second one. There's a number of arguments to be made. Compliance is the second one, in my opinion. So every, all the regulations that you have to comply with, uh, upcoming GDPR, uh, these kind of privacy regulations, uh, banks have their own uh, regulations that they have to comply with. A lot of regulations are in place that the organization would comply with. And also that is an argument to do, to do this. Uh, so is it in general an easy sell? No, it isn't. But there are definitely arguments to be made uh, that you can use based on the context, based on return on investment to some extent, based on a number of these things. I'll be discussing this a bit also in one of the afternoon sessions, how to, how to defend the case to, uh, to, to higher management. Okay? Okay. So, as a wrap up here, um, the example that, that we've discussed here, it's, an, uh, it's a mature model. Microsoft has been running this since 2000, so more than 15 years now. They know what they do. Actually, the model is totally open. You can, well, totally, you can go to their website and download the model and actually release new versions of the model. It's available. Um, I think we're getting uh, the, the N-1 or the N-2 model. So internally, they're ahead of what you see on the website, but it's, but it's out there. You can go there, you can have a read, you can have a look and see what they are doing. Uh, it's kind of heavyweight. If you would implement everything that we discussed, it will have an impact on the organization. Yeah. You will see that. Yeah, it's kind of heavyweight. And it's also definitely uh, uh, yeah, oriented towards uh, 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 software vendors, that's clear. Uh, so, for instance, the, interest, the incident response or the, the beta release, it's definitely linked to, to how they organize themselves and what's the sector. Um, they have quite some supporting tools and methods on their websites as well. They have threat modeling tools, they have coding guidelines, they have some indication of trainings. There's quite some material out there. So it's kind of an interesting, uh, interesting thing to look at. Uh, other process model exists. I've only discussed one. But what, what I will keep on stressing is not, not a single process model which will fit your organization. You will have to combine and mix and match and make sure that it's fully aligned with what your context is rather than just taking one model and applying it like that. That will not work. That's, that's pretty sure. Okay? Any final questions, thoughts on this part? No? Okay, let's go to the agile development part. Uh, as I said, a bit more, more difficult in my opinion, but there, there are definitely a number of things that we, that, we, that we can be doing. As I also said, there's not like a real model or standard out there. Not that I know of. It might exist, I'm not aware of it. Uh, what you do see on conferences that are linked to software or security or secure software development, you typically see a lot of talks about it. So a lot of people are experimenting with how should we address this topic. And you see a lot of different ideas popping up, a lot of different uh, experiences. Uh, so it's, it's still a domain that's, that's kind of growing and we're kind of figuring out how, how to do it. Okay. Um, so a small introduction on Agile. Does everybody know what Agile development is? Yeah? Okay. Not spending time there. Okay. Let's go uh, further. Okay. Okay. Let's stay here. Then let's, let's, let's have a quick look here. So if you look at agile development, agile development is all about speed and flexibility. Agile development is all about having short cycles, typically three, two, three, four week cycles, sprint cycles, very short, makes you, allow, allows you to very easily uh, change the requirements, what you want to implement. It typically, although it's not meant for that, but it typically produ produces not a lot of documentation go to agile development teams, ask what their architectural document is. Chances are that you will not find it. You might not find it for traditional documents, uh, waterfall cycles either, but the chances are higher, in my opinion, for agile development that you won't find it. Uh, and it's typically functional driven. Why? Because um, the, the product owner typically decides what to do in the next sprint, and the product owner typically cares a lot about functionality. 
So it's very functionality driven. Although it shouldn't be the case, in reality, in practice, it, it is often like that. Okay, now, if you look at security, on the other hand, security is all about stability and rigor. Trying to do full analysis on what is the software, can I find some extra security hole, is there some vulnerability out there, but you have to do that on stable product. If it changes every two to three weeks, it's very difficult to reason about it. You will have to do the reasoning entire, uh, always again. It takes a lot of time. Uh, security is about extra activities. We've seen the SDL model. How many act extra activities did you have there? 15, 20? Okay, if you have to push, the, push all these activities in a short, short cycle of two to three weeks, yeah, it will break. It will not work. Uh, you will have to do a lot of analysis, but you don't, typically don't have a lot of documentation. Sure, you can go look into all the source code that you have, but all the other documents, and you can go look in the pro, in product backlog for the requirements. But that's, that's typically most of the important documents or, or things that are out there. Um, and security is typically a non-functional requirement, that goes without saying. So, you kind of feel the mismatch. Yeah? Do you agree? I mean, the first three points that you make about security, are these points mainly based on the fact that we built the SDLC for the waterfall system? <coughs> I mean, I agree with the non-functional for sure. I mean, yeah. it stays non-functional. But the other ones are, I mean, why is it stable? And why these extra activities, I think we should like look and how can we implement it into the agile development? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Very good point, and that's also what we should be doing. Uh, now, the, the fact remains that if you want to have guarantees, some assurance in a piece of software being uh, okay in terms of security, you'll have to do some analysis. And how you build that analysis into the agile life cycle, that's a different, that's a different fact, or that's a different discussion, but still, you'll have to do the analysis somehow. The analysis will not disappear since you're doing agile. No, but um, but then we go from the fact that the analysis happens outside the development team yeah. by someone else. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, no, indeed. I fully agree. I fully, it's about that discussion, I think. How can we organize ourselves and how can we give sufficient responsibility to the development team to make sure that the end result in terms of quality is more or less the same? That's the challenge that we have. Are we there yet? I don't think so, but that's, that's what, we, that, what we should be aiming for, exactly. Yeah. There's also the, the, I think the misconception that, that Agile development doesn't require architecture or something like that. Of course you need architecture and you need security constraints and stuff like that in your, in the whole, there, there is architectural documentation there, or there should be. Yeah. At least for, especially for security stuff. I, I, with not, respect, I disagree. The whole yeah. point of Agile is to drop documentation and move fast and to be Agile and switch your whole architecture at the drop of a hat. This is what, I, I agree with you, frankly, but this is what a lot of the traditional Agile documentation yeah. says. No documentation, yeah. no, no, not found, not foundating yourself on a standard architecture if you're willing to be very flexible yes. on that. That's what the documentation in Agile says, but the reality is, I think, yeah, this, you, you will need some, some kind of, of, of thought or vision somewhere to, uh, to be able to do, uh, to do security or to develop software at all. I, 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 agree. I agree. I, I think, but that's, that's more the lean side of the, the Agile. Uh, I think it, I, so. it is also a, a discussion about Agile in general. I mean, no yeah. one knows exactly how to implement it. Every company implements it differently. Yeah. And, I mean, and what you said before, it's important, I think, putting constraints on your development yeah. teams is important. <coughs> I mean, you can't just let them go and say, okay, you're completely agile, do whatever you want. No, you, there need to be some yeah. It, yeah. instruction. It, and if I may, the trend is actually away from agile to DevOps now, mm -hmm. which is even less documentation, yeah. faster, and less time for strong architecture. So the trend is really going away from that, which is a problem. It, it, yes, it's all by itself somewhere. Agile is also about trusting the, the teams in, in making sure that they do a good job. So for instance, about the architecture, it's quite often the case that there will be a technical lead in the team that, that has the architecture in his head. And that if, whenever there's an important decision to be, make, to be made, he will do it based on the information that he has in his head. But that also means that we don't have the documentation anymore. So we kind of have to, if we need to understand 
if a new developer comes in and wants to understand what is the setup of the software, he will have to either have a discussion of two hours with the technical lead or yeah, start looking to the code to, to yeah. figure out what's going on. Eh? Yeah, that's why we actually do have an architecture document, documentation yeah. in our project. And it's not even a very big project, but yes. Yeah, yeah. But I, I don't compare it it's a problem. I mean, I see it as a challenge. I mean, it's a problem because we started doing security on a on a legacy kind of building software. I yeah. mean, on the waterfall system. Yeah. And, yeah. and now it's a challenge to adapt to kind of yeah exactly to the exactly system. yeah yeah okay so a lot of things will uh, will come back I think but. Uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, traditional uh, waterfall SDL models are about control. That's what they try to do. They try to add extra activities, add extra control gates, make sure that the end result is under control, that you have assurance in the, outer, in the quality of the software product. Secure Agile is much more about enabling security rather than about controlling. So whatever we try to do in Agile, you'll see a lot more activities that go towards supporting people, make sure that they know how to do it, they being the development team, rather than controlling from a central perspective how, it's, how, it's, uh, how, it's, how the quality is. And of course, there will always be, have to be a balance between the two. From an organization perspective, you'll have to make sure that you understand the, the security posture of all the other applications that you're building. But again, the point is more about giving the teams the responsibility rather than controlling centrally. That's kind of what's going on, and that's where we're kind of looking for what's the best balance and how, how can we best do that, right? Okay, so if we were again looking, uh, if we were again looking to this mental model, in my opinion, where the, the most change is, is in the process part and the tools and components part. There is where traditional waterfall cycles and agile uh, developments differ the most. Because we still need the team, we still need the knowledge. That doesn't change. You still need to do, you need to know how to deal with injection attacks, how to do uh, yeah, these kind of things. And the, the people, okay, you will give them more responsibilities, but the people will still stay there, and you will have to train them these guys. Yeah. So the, the differences are there. So let's let's have some uh, have some discussion. I have a number of yeah, okay, sorry about that. I have a number of slides there. Uh, so. <coughs> The idea, so what, what should be the general principles about secure agile, securing agile? Try to make security a natural part of the process, but, but don't, don't overdo. I've, I've seen quite a number of um, testimonials of people that try to uh, impose security models on, on agile development companies, and the end result is very often that it doesn't scale. They try to be in every planning meeting, they try to be in every uh, a demonstration meeting. They try to be in every uh, um, retrospective. And if you have like an entire company, three people that, that have to do all this work, it doesn't scale anymore. So you have to figure out ways of what do you want to do yourself and what does the, the team uh, needs to do and find a good balance there that scales. And that's really about this don't overdo it. Try to implement the security ideas into the process, but make sure that, you, that the central team doesn't have to do everything, but it will, because it will not work. It's, it's not sustainable. Uh, for all the activities that, that, that you do, make sure that they are small activities. Make, make sure that they can run very frequently, iter iteratively, uh, in process, while the people are doing it. Not extra activities that they have to do in a sprint. No, while they're doing their activity in sprint, make sure that, that it's kind of supported by security somehow. Yeah. So make sure that they're lightweight, in phase, and iterative. Uh, and then think about preventive and detective controls, right? Detective controls being uh, do a source code scan by a, by a SAS tool, for instance, that would be detective control. Preventive control would r rather be build, build secure coding guidelines. That's a detective, that's a detective A, detective control to put in place. Yeah. Um, still, you might think about being involved in key mo moments in the process. The product planning, for instance, is a very important moment in agile development. If you miss that boat for security, it's basically game over, more or less. You have to make sure that you have, that you're somehow involved in that project planning meeting in some way. Does it have to be a central team that's involved? No, not at all. It can be like a security person that's in the team, but at least that security, the security philosophy or ID is involved in a project planning meeting. Otherwise, you're getting nowhere. 
Um, of course, make sure that you're leveraging on, on agile concepts. Think, uh, talk about user stories, talk about the backlog, talk about respect, retrospective, talk about these things where agile is built on, the fundamental things of agile. If you cannot succeed in doing that, in leveraging those, again, you will not get it. You won't get this, uh, this security into these processes. Um, one problem that I also see uh, often made, also for traditional development life cycles, by the way, is trying to do an, a, a, a one big uh, new security model or security development life cycle put in place. It's an error to do it for traditional life cycles. It's even more of an error to do it for agile life cycles. Don't try to, the, 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 the most successful teams and companies that I've seen are the companies that are trying to, do, to build very small steps at a time. And if one step works very well, and you have it under control for different teams, think about one small next step. And do it like that, otherwise you will not get there. You will fail. Okay, so let's have a look at some of these uh, uh, agile concepts that we, might, that we might be leveraging. First of all, requirements, user stories. What do we do there? So we have to figure out a way to get security requirements into user stories, right? If we are not succeeding that, your requirement will not be taken in a planning meeting. And if it's not taken in a planning meeting, there will be no security in the product. That's what's happened. So we'll have to figure out a way how to get there. Um, so will we have to build user stories for security? Now, there are different ways to do that. I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, but um, make sure that if you're defining user stories, that people know that it's, that it's easy to reason about, that people know what it is, and think about reusable user stories. While I'm, I'm not a big fan of reusable security requirements, I've seen some situations where people try to build like a, a book of reusable security user stories. And to some extent, it might make sense. If you are talking about compliance regulations, if we have privacy regulation, it might make sense to define one or two user stories linked to privacy that can always be applied to these systems. Like with general, general requirements, and of course for every application it will have to be more concretized, but again, these reusable user stories make it quite easy for people to take them into account. Was there a comment or no? Okay, sorry. Um, so, I'm not a big fan of reusable requirements, but I think it makes sense to think about user stories and, and have, have like a small catalog of reusable user stories. For general security requirements, I think it makes sense. Um, second thing, um, for all the normal user stories, it might make sense to start labeling them in terms of security. Is this a high risk security, is, that, is this a high risk functional requirement or is this, is this a low risk functional requirement? Because if it's a high risk, you, we might be taking into, that into account in the planning game. So, yeah, go ahead. So much of security is non-functional requirements. Yeah. How, uh, you, you cover that coming up? Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's, that's, that's the next bullet. Yeah. So, but so first, one of the things that might help you do the argument during planning game is labeling all the user stories, the functional user stories, basically with, with the security level, somehow. How risky is it? What is the impact, for instance? Label that. And if you have that information, it will be more easy to do the discussion during the planning game. Okay, and then coming to the functional versus non-functional. In my opinion, there are different ways in which we can do security requirements in Agile. Yeah? For the functional security requirements, it's quite easy. We'll, we'll write functional user stories. We will write security user stories. So we will write the user stories saying, you will have to do authentication. You will have to do authorization. You will have to do logging. That's basically a user story. You can combine it in one epic, two epics, three epics, whatever. You will have to have security user stories. Okay, this is everything related to functionality. That's, that's the easy part. The quality related security requirements, yeah, if, if you remember, we have security, functional security and quality security. The quality related security requirements, there are different ways in which you can do that, in which you can put them in user stories. One of the things, one of the concepts is defini definition of DOM in user story. When is a user story actually implemented? Yeah. Typically it will, it will say like, um, okay, when it's properly tested, uh, when, when um, all the documentation, the architectural documentation is updated, these kind of things. Okay. 
you can actually use these definitions of DOM also for security. You can say, okay, it's properly implemented when we did a security unit test. When we updated the threat model, for instance. So you can list some of these quality related things in the definition of DOM. Yeah? That's one element. Second element is acceptance criteria. Every user story has acceptance criteria. What are the criteria to be checked for, for checking whether a user, uh, user story is implemented or not? Also there, we can put security elements in there. We can say, okay, you should not only test the functional flow, you should all also try uh, some, some negative input, some unexpected input. Put it in there and test it and see what comes out. So for all the functional related requirements, <coughs> define user stories. For all the quality related requirements for security, <coughs> work on definition of done and acceptance criteria. So basically we have the elements in place to work on it, right? So that means we have it under control, as least, at, at least as we, at we, as we, if we um, succeed in defining the security elements, functional, non-functional, in these user stories. Okay, talking about user stories and abuser stories. User stories are quite often very functional in nature. Um, <clears throat> the problem with user stories, and if you're only thinking about acceptance criteria and definition of DOM, is that you might miss out on the entire black part. Remember the, 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 the yin-yang that I showed in the beginning of the session? It's about functionality, but also what can go wrong, right? Somehow we have to also capture what can go wrong in development or in, in the software and capture that. One of the things that you might be able to do is uh, defining explicit user stories, which they actually call abuser stories, to capture what might go wrong. And so that means that you're actually specifying negative user stories. And that, that's an example could be, for instance, user X should not have access to this type of data. And you could capture that as maybe either an acceptance criteria or, if it's important enough, as separate user stories. But then you're not thinking about functionality, you're explicitly thinking about what might go wrong and I want to avoid that and make that explicit as well. Okay? I see some frowning here and there. If you're not convinced, uh, raise it. This is tough. It's very tough. It's really tough to get this. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, but we have to think about it because if we, if we don't think about what, what should be avoided, what should be avoided in software and we don't specify that somewhere, yeah, you're basically missing out on a lot of, uh, a lot of risks in the software. So, yeah. And if I may, this is not something we have to go through every project. I can envision taking something like ASPS, look at all the non-functional requirements that are pretty much standard for any kind of software and make a generic list of abuser stories that we can drop into any project. Having to re rethink this every time for supplies <coughs> is tough. So. I, I would love to be able to have some kind of resource that I can just drop in. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's very doable. Yeah, you don't, I, you don't like it. No, I don't like it. I don't like it. Yeah, it, it takes away from billable hours. No, no, that's that's totally not the point. Totally not the point. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm happy to do the discussion as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, the value of abuser stories, in my opinion, is about abuser stories that are tailored to the software. If you're, I've, I've seen throwing a lot of, uh, and I actually I made the argument myself in a previous slide, eh? we can make this reusable, eh? so I, I, I follow the argument, but having tons of um, reusable abuser stories for every software the same, what will happen after, in the first, in the first uh, development life cycle, they will look at it. In the second development, uh, iteration, sprint or whatever, they will say, yeah, we've seen that. In the third, like, okay not interesting anymore. So if they're not applied to your software at hand, and if they're not concrete enough, it, it, it won't fly in my opinion. And that's the reason why I don't like it. But can't you make it more concrete with like clear questions like, okay, do we have user data stored in this application? <coughs> okay, in that case, we need these specific user stories that say, well, we have to, how we store this data or something like that. Or okay, something yeah, like that. Okay. sure. But, then, standards yeah, user but, stories but then but that means that you will always have to define concrete user stories based on, on, that, on that situation. You, you, so you first say, okay, we have to have some questions 
Um, and if we know, okay, there's like confidential, confidential data in there, we have, we have to have a user story that kind of looks like that, but you have to make it more concrete, right? Or, or not? Yeah, no, my point is that, that you have these reusable user stories that you have like kind of a list of user stories, but you're gonna think about, okay, how, what is exactly my application and you only take user stories that apply to. Yeah. Yeah, you, yeah. I mean, it's a little bit more fine grained than just saying, okay, okay. apply all the users. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't know. So. Here's my concern. When, when I take a user story for something generic like SQL injection that mm -hmm. cover the whole software, yeah. the more concrete I make it, the, the, the less it's going to apply to the whole system. So I start giving you really good user stories and explains avoiding SQL injection. That, that's going to be, the, the better the story is, the more it's specific to one scenario, and the less it's going to uh, provide a good story yeah. that has coverage across the whole system. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that's my, that's my yeah. concern. I don't have it figured out in my head. Yeah. I, 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 again, I don't follow that, but uh, happy to discuss. The reason why I don't follow it is because a user story, you have to be able to implement it. Right? If you have a lot of user stories that are generic and that stay on the backlog just as advice, I don't think they are good user stories. And then, the, and then as a developer, when I read this uh, very concrete, specific user story, mm -hmm. that, has me, that gets me to go fix SQL injection for that story. It does encourage me to fix it for the system. Yeah, but and that, if you want enough user stories that are concrete to cover the whole system, you'll need like a thousand user stories just to cover SQL injection. Yeah, but then I would rather advise to work with these kind of uh, concepts gotcha. because they have the power to do actually supporting those quality criteria rather than defining separate user stories for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My opinion is that uh, the view stories uh, have a similarity or an analogy with uh, blacklist. And to me, blacklisting is not working uh, in practice. Uh, so I definitely believe <coughs> in, in stories that are, that have a, Mm -hmm. So therefore, I yeah. think yeah. I rather believe in implementation uh, from a positive point of view rather than yeah. from a blacklist. Point. Yeah, the, I I totally agree. I totally agree. I I only think, and I'm I'm, I'm yeah. The problem is that if we're only focusing on uh, positive user stories, we're kind of missing out of an entire um, domain of what should not happen. We're always thinking about what should happen. And if we only focus on what should happen, I'm pretty sure that we'll um, come in situations where we say, oh, damn, we haven't thought about that. And by doing explicitly this negative analysis and making the, the high risks that we see concrete, I think we kind of support that in a bit. Now, whether you discuss that or whether you support that in uh, acceptance criteria or whether you make separate abuser stories, it's, it's a matter of philosophy, it's a matter of what, what works best in your organization. But you, you, in my opinion, you really have to explicitly think about negative security requirements and find a way to represent them. And in my opinion, you, abuser stories might work if we don't end up with like 100 abuser stories or 200, because again, then it will not work anymore. There will be just too many abuser stories on the, on the backlog and people will not look into them anymore. Okay, so, uh, oh, have to move on. Uh, sprint planning, um, um, there is actually where it's, where it's, where it's really important, yeah? making sure that security activities are in there. Um, so if we have security user stories uh, in our backlog, we, we, can, uh, we can plan them. Problem is quite often that um, product owners don't select these security user stories. Now, I think there, um, Microsoft has defined an interesting model. What they did is they um, kind of um, categorized the user stories into different categories, the different types. User stories that must be executed every sprint, user stories that are part of the group and you have to implement one of these user stories of that group, and then user stories that you have to implement once, once for the entire project. And by doing that, I think they, you actually have some kind of leverage to make sure that security related user stories also come in the, in the product planning. To give an example, but I have to run over it uh, because of time. Um, so for instance, every sprint security requirements, you might say for instance, okay, 
uh, make sure that you mitigate against SQL injection or cross-site scripting. Uh, if, you, if you compile the code, make sure that during linking, it's compiled with a particular uh, option. Uh, you have to do it every time that you build, right? Uh, these are every sprint requirements. Bucket requirements are, you have different categories, and so for instance, for every sprint from bucket A, you have to choose one. From bucket B, you have to choose one, and from bucket C, you have to choose one. Whatever you choose, it doesn't matter. It does matter, but, but it's, it's open. Um, but make sure that from every bucket you choose one, right? And then the last category is um, do it once for the entire product life cycle. So for instance, create a baseline threat model. You would typically start at once, and then you would update the threat model for every, uh, for every sprint uh, if, if, if uh, functionally changing. I think that's a quite elegant way of getting the user stories and the, the, what is relevant for security also in, in, the planning, in the planning meeting and forcing it quite, uh, to some extent. Okay, secure development, uh, sorry, agile development, it's a lot about quality, um, um, ensuring quality, and they do that a lot by testing. Test-driven development, agile development, it's, it's quite linked. Also for security, it's relevant. In the sense that there's a lot of security testing that can be done, and that can be automated also to some extent during the sprints. Uh, think about unit testing, not so very easy to do for security, but there are relevant security tests that you might consider as unit tests. Um, regression testing, very, if, if uh, vulnerabilities have been found before, try to make sure that, uh, that they're not in this release. Do regression testing. Static analysis and dynamic analysis is quite yeah, standard ways of, of testing software, I would say. Starting looking at the code, dynamic looking at the runtime of the software, and then fuzzing. A lot of these tests can actually be automated, and that's what you should be thinking about during sprints, right? Because if you have to do like a manual code review for every, every sprint, it will not work. You will need three weeks for three weeks of development, it will not work. So there are tools that can help you with that. Uh, what happens for some um, projects uh, or project stops is that they use an iteration zero. Before you're actually starting development, you, you first do a sprint in which you prepare everything to allow further development. That's also a very interesting point for security because also there you can reason about, okay, do we have coding guidelines? Do we have the tools in place? Who is responsible to this and this and that? What's the architecture? Is the architecture threat modeled? A lot of the activities that you would typically do and think about, you can actually execute them in iteration zero. So it's a very interesting point also to hook, to hook into. Um, okay, this I'm gonna skip. Uh, I thought I had some slide on the retrospective, but that has disappeared. I'm gonna quickly say the message in one, in one minute. Um, retrospective is also an interesting point in the sense that typically you discuss about what are the things that went wrong in this sprint, typically security kind of goes wrong <laughs> from time to time in sprints. So if you have a security person in his retrospectives that can say, okay, in this sprint again, there was no security user story planned. And if you can, can continue that argument for the, the 10 sprints to come, hopefully it will, it, will, uh, it will make them clear that there's something going wrong. In this sprint, we needed actually a tool to support us in security testing, but we don't have tooling then at least people know that we should be working on that. So also again, retrospective is an interesting point to look into. Okay, let's quickly talk about tools and components. Um, so again, uh, Secure Agile is about enabling rather than controlling, we've been there. Um, we need to have some tool support and tool support that support the people in iterative, iterative steps, small steps and going are always available. So they should continuously work, they should integrate well in the developer's world, and they should avoid causing too much overhead, right? Um, every time a, a developer checks in code at night and there is an automate, automated security analysis being performed during the night, these are interesting tools. If you have a developer EDE, EDE like Eclipse or, or NetBeans or whatever, if you can somehow support the coding guidelines in that IDE, and make sure that developers have them at hand while doing coding, these are the tools that work. Rather than having like separate coding guidelines on, on the shelf that people have to look into every time because it's, that's, 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 that's kind of annoying, that doesn't work. Okay, 
for the, the tool chain, um, the tool chain for Agile is, much, is really important and much more important for security because this, this is where you can make the difference for security development in the in Agile tool chain. Um, so this one, for instance, I just discussed, have make sure that you can somehow uh, support the developer in their IDE. There are tools nowadays on the market that um, not only do static analysis, but also help uh, developers implement or support them in what are the secure coding guidelines. Oh, you're writing these three statements, but actually our, organ our enterprise advises to do it differently. Use this and this and that. If you can do that proactively to developers, that works quite well, actually. Um, make sure that they have common development environments. And a, a comment that I hear quite often is that, okay, I want to do security, but actually we have a, we have a global policy that, that, uh, that enforces us to use single sign-on, SAML-based single sign-on, but I can't do tests in development with SAML-based single sign-on because we don't have an identity provider there. Yeah, okay, that doesn't make sense. Sorry? Yeah, make one. Yeah, yeah make one, but make sure that, that your developers have that at their disposal. It should be ready, it should be there. If you're imposing a standard and there's no support whatsoever to implement the standard, yeah, then, then that doesn't work. Source control and versioning makes sense. I think yeah. it's, it speaks for itself. Uh, regarding security testing, you can again reason about what kind of testing can you do where uh, and when. And there are testing that you can do daily, per sprint, or just one time. Again, think about the Microsoft bucket system, the every sprint bucket or, or, or once you can have the same arguments for the testing. Think about what testing you can do daily, what testing you can do once, once per sprint, okay? Um, quite important, if you're running these security testing uh, tools and you don't integrate with the tools that the Agile team is using, again, it will, diff it will be difficult to work with. So think about how you can integrate the output of these testing tools, for instance, in the backlog. If it's automatically integrated in the backlog, with some sanitization, it will be easier for the next uh, sprint planning meeting to take that into account and to see, hey, we have an issue. We have like 10 critical vulnerabilities. Can we, can we, can we define a task to fix those 10 critical vulnerabilities? Right? Okay, so we have to kind of close off the meeting, the, the session, sorry. Um, secure builds, make sure that you have tools in place to automatically build software and taking security properties into account, do automated code signing, do automated obfuscation. Um, secure deploy, going towards DevOps, um, how can you automatically deploy, what is necessary there, uh, and consider a lot of properties that are again relevant for security. Automated key generation, certificate, certificate uh, uh, yeah, linking, whatever, certificate pinning, these kind of things, um, configuring web application firewalls, application monitoring, make sure that that's like automated. Okay. One interesting point to kind of uh, close off the session, um, you see quite a lot of organizations that combine agile and, and traditional uh, models. I think in terms of security, it's quite an interesting model because what you then have is you typically would have the entire project initiation phase with analysis and architecture that's kind of traditional waterfall where you have things under control, let's put it that way. Development is then done, do, 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 done using Agile methods, sprints for, for all the user stories, all the tasks, and then again the release is more traditional. We have quite a lot of organizations, there are studies that indicate that, that, that they produce better quality as well for software, but for security, I think it's not a bad model. Because if you're really working in full Agile uh, models, again, we have to rethink how to do things. We are not there yet, I think we have to, we have to we have to really think about how to integrate security in this, uh, in this, in this method. Okay, and then to uh, close off uh, this slide, but I'm not going to go through it. Uh, the slides are online. A number of best practices that I wanted to share with you, but we don't have time anymore to discuss it. Uh, but um, I would say have a read because we have to close off, otherwise lunch will be uh, skipped, I was told, so that's not a good idea either. <laughs> so, thanks for your attention. Uh, any final question? Or we can discuss during uh, your lunch or other sessions. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>